Nice. Nice to be here with you all tonight. Tonight we are on chapter three of our book, and that is uh, going to be a discussion on karma, law of cause and effect. <laughs> so before we dive into that, let's meditate. Let's drop in, drop out, tune in, tune, tune out, and have a good nourishing time. I think we all need it if you feel like me. You know, this marathon just is, it's, it's a wheel of samsara that keeps going round and round, and sometimes we can feel a little down or a little um, taxed. And so meditation, it's not always easy to remember that we can do something like meditate when we're feeling that way. So I'm glad we're here together to do that and um, kind of re rewire, do a little rewiring. So let's get comfortable. And that could be lying down at the end of a long day. Sometimes the best position is the supine pose. I always say that, that it's one of the four positions taught by the Buddha. There's lying, standing, walking, seated. In essence, what he was teaching was not just four boxed in positions, but he was teaching that we should meditate in all of our activity, whether we're moving, seated, sleeping or standing still so let's get comfortable find a position that you can hold with relative ease and stillness because when the body is still you know yeah okay we can do walking meditation which is important or doing the dishes meditation which is good to learn how to do but when we have this carved out time to be still whether it's supine or seated uh, the more still the body is, the easier it is for the mind to settle. So try to find a position that is something that you can hold with relative relaxation, ease, and stillness for a good, you know, 30 minutes. And if you have to move, just move with mindfulness, slowly, conscientiously. No problem. Okay. I thought tonight, in the spirit of soothing the nervous system, we would do a little breath work to start. So first we'll start with our motivation, a very important part of the karmic teachings, because it's said that our motivation behind whatever we do determines the outcome. And so in the beginning of practice, we always arouse a motivation of a heart, a heart motivation of bodhicitta. So rewiring that feeling of goodness, of compassion for ourselves through our practice to be of benefit, to be healing, and really to be a gift. May our practice be a gift for our life tonight. Replenish us so we can be a gift for another. And now just feel your breath natural at ease before we start to lengthen it a little bit for our pranayama. Pranayama literally means to work with the breath, to extend the breath. Prana is a synonym for the breath, also for energy. Yama is to constrain or to work with. It's definitely different than just simple mindfulness of breathing where you're not controlling it, you're just observing it. So it's important to be clear on what we're doing here. We're going to do a little work with the breath. And a simple practice that's helped me a lot lately is to extend the length of the out breath to a couple more counts than the in breath. So I'll suggest let's just start with a three count in breath. Let's all exhale together. We're breathing through the nose. And then when you're ready, inhale one, two, three. And then let's exhale 
four, five, or six, four, five, I'm sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, that must have been really confusing. Okay, let's try again. Inhale, one, two, three, exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six, inhale, one, two, three, exhale, one, two, three, four, five, six, keep going like this, this longer out breath helps to calm the nervous system to ignite the parasympathetic nervous system. Roughly, you're just extending the length of the out breath to, you know, double or almost double of that whatever in breath you take. But don't strain, just be at ease. I'll let you count yourself and let the counting also be a shamatha practice. If you know the ujjayi breath, a gentle constriction at the root of the throat as a way to elongate the breath, you can do that, but don't force or strain. The breath is naturally longer than the three counts. Just do whatever the natural in-breath is and then extend the out-breath by a few more counts or double it. Keep going. We'll do three more rounds at your own pace. And at the end of the last round, now release any control of the breath and let the breath be at ease. Natural inflow and outflow. Let go of any manipulation, any effort. It's like you're coasting into a nice, warm pool of breath. Let go of any ujjayi breath, any pranayama, yogic breathing. Let the mouth be soft, the jaw slack, 
Breathing through the nose or mouth now, as you wish. The eyes either closed or slightly open, gazing at a comfortable angle towards the floor. The muscles of the face are soft and relaxed. The shoulders melting down away from the ears. The hands on your lap or thighs. Feel the spine nice and lifted, but relaxed. The chin slightly drawn in towards the center of the throat. The tip of the tongue resting at the upper palate. As you recall all of these key points of the posture, don't lose your relaxation and your spaciousness. Belly is nice and soft. The hips, the legs in a comfortable position. And now it's like you're surfing the breath. It's almost like one of those perpetual waves, like a wave pool. Just ride the breath. The balance between laxity and excitation keeps you from falling off the board. Just stay in the moment. When you get pulled away, just try to jump back on. Keep riding the wave of the breath. Soothing the body, soothing the breath, soothing the mind into their natural state of ease, relaxation, that inner well of being. Notice any areas of constriction, either mental, physical, emotional. Let the breath expand into those areas and break down any boundaries. Break down the walls. You may even feel awareness expanding beyond 
the walls of the skull or the body. Let's all let the eyes be slightly open now. Settling the mind in its natural state, this feeling of the walls breaking down as the eyes open. And realizing that awareness pervades all of space. At least the space around you, you can tell. The visual field, but also there's a quality of presence. It goes beyond just the physical body. Let's just call this awareness now, your own luminous nature, like the sunlight shining. Your awareness shines in all directions. And let that luminosity pervade the feeling sense. Of your being the mere simple act of being, moment to moment to moment. The breath is still there, it's like a background anchor now, but now you're focusing more on the domain of the mind itself, this awareness playground, through which all the senses filter. And if at any time you thing we did at the beginning, any old time, but with mindfulness of breathing and with settling the mind in its natural state, two different forms of shamatha, we just let the breath be natural at ease, unforced. Settling the mind in its natural state is like observing the appearances that arise and pass within that field or domain of the mind. Like players on a stage, we just observe. We don't cling to or attach or identify. Just watch the arising, the abiding, and the passing away of thoughts, feelings, the whole arc, just observing. You're fully present, and yet you're not fused with those thoughts and feelings.
It can be helpful to relax the gaze and feel as if you could see 360 degrees around you. Without focusing on any one thing in particular, let the gaze be vacant, diffuse. Now, as a little holiday gift, I'd love to give you an experience of shamatha without a sign, without an object. So we're playing now. All this is, is releasing even that sense of observing the domain of the mind as the anchor, which is settling the mind in its natural state, into a practice of pure presence called awareness of awareness. So we extend, we continue that feeling of being present in the moment, that luminosity pervading all thoughts, feelings, emotions. And just simply be aware of that awareness. Steep in it, soak in it, and be awake to it. The eyes remain open, the gaze is vacant, relaxed, blink whenever you need to.
and just simply let yourself be. Sounds easy, but see for yourself. Can you just be aware of being aware? And releasing distraction as soon as it pokes its head up. Self-liberated, wrong draw, a natural liberation on the spot. And return to this feeling of being aware of being aware.
And now, if it hasn't already, recall, remember, or re, reignite this knowing that the awareness is warm like the sun. It is bodhicitta. It's the heart as well, not just the mind. So if you've been up in the head, drop the awareness down into the heart, even down into the belly, and feel like you're breathing, that you're awareing from all of those centers, the belly, the heart, and the head centers. And rest in the awareness of all of those centers as best as you can, open, ignited, pervaded by awareness. Feel the breath in your belly and the chest and the throat and the head. And knowing, remembering that when the belly is enlivened, there's a quality of presence, of authenticity, grounded, that you are here, here with yourself and here with the other. And when you're here in the belly center, it supports the heart to feel safe, to open and bloom like a flower, nourished by the earth below. And this quality of openness, availability of tenderness, perhaps of love, of compassion, in the heart space. And then when the heart is open and blooming, then it gives rise to a delightful fragrance of awareness, clarity of presence in the head center, the third eye, the eyes wide open, a wakefulness.
And now let's take a moment to close with a dedication of good energy, whatever we've cultivated, we see, we feel it spreading out in all directions, offering it to all beings everywhere. The, the belly, heart, and head center focus is, you know, nothing that original or new, but it's a technique that I learned from a mentor of mine, Jennifer Wellwood. Eve studies with her as well. So it's just such a nourishing practice of really feeling into and embodying, like enlivening these three centers in our being, whether we're meditating and doing it or going about our day. It's a nice tool for you to remember so gift of that and you know the awareness of awareness sounds so easy but it's not it's kind of like you come to the point where when you when 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 we do that it's like having the rug pulled out from under you <laughs> you know and that can be um fun <laughs> maybe you could f zip fly around a little bit or float or it can be disorienting or a little destabilizing. So, you know, I gave you a taste of it. If you feel ready to play with it, please play with it during your time off here. If it's something that felt a little too much to right now for you, don't bother, don't worry about it. No, no sweat. Um, stick with the shamatha practices with, with a sign, with an object, the breath, or a mantra even, or a visualization or a slogan, or the mind itself, which is settling the mind in its natural state. That is still shamatha with an object. So we're continuing on with the book. Are there any questions or comments? Anyone wanna share or ask any questions about the practice? Karen. Hi, Chandra. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, I was just curious, like I've been doing a lot of shamatha, or not a lot, but I'm in Michael Taft's Vast Sky Mind course, and which is a lot of like shamatha into shamatha without an object. Mm. I guess I just have been doing, thinking of it as the without an object as resting your mind in its natural state. And then I think maybe you hinted that that's not quite right. And mm -hmm. also, I think you answered another question, but I had during the meditation, within the meditation was that sometimes I, in when I'm doing that, I drop into the heart just to sort of like get out of my head. And mm -hmm. um, I didn't know, I haven't really talked to Michael about it or anything, but um, I didn't know if that was like an okay move, but maybe it is okay move to do when you're doing shamatha without an object. So I don't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So the first question is true. Is that technically settling the mind in its natural state is shamatha with a sign and we're taking the domain of the mind as the sign, as the, as the anchor. It has a similar flavor as awareness of awareness, but it's, it's, it's different because you're letting go completely of even that and you're just resting in the being. It's a bit, it's, it's kind of like the, the other practices should have a flavor of that leading up to it, but then you take the anchor out. And then the other, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if, I mean, nobody ever says you should be in your head really. So dropping into the heart is totally fine. I mean, like, you know, like 
why shouldn't we just already be in the heart anyway? <laughs> right? Um, I think we think we're in the head because all of our senses are up there, right? Most of them, except for the tactile sense, but the, the visual sense, the, the olfactory sense, the gustatory sense, the um, auditory sense, visual sense, those senses are all up here. So it concentrates our prana in this part of the body. So we think we live up here. It's a, no wonder we think that. Uh, but 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 we don't we're not just up here really it's kind of an illusion i'll never forget reading what book was it on quantum physics um wholeness in the implicate order perhaps by david baum this was back in my college days you know 20 years ago but it's a very interesting book and i think in that book he talked about an experiment that just sounds so horrible. But of course, people do these crazy experiments where they put, they had a maze and they had rats or mice that would go f learn the maze, learn the maze, get the cheese at the end of the maze, and then piece by piece take out parts of their brain because they're trying to figure out where self, where memory lives. And they took out a piece, the mouse could still find the, the cheese through the maze. Another piece, more pieces. They took out most of the brain, they took out all of the brain that they could without killing it, and the mouse could still find it. And so what they deduced was that the memory lives in the whole body, you know, that we're not just the brain. The book, you know, that, this sounds a little pop science coming from me, but the book is a very, very um, well-respected book and science experiments. So, you know, this whole idea of like we're in the head, we're really not. I mean, so yeah, dropping into the heart and meditating from the heart center, even meditating from the navel center, because the enteric nervous system apparently has more neurons than our brain does. No wonder yeah, doctors so thought, what? Oh, sorry. I I really like that the belly thing too. That place is still really like dark and. I know, isn't it? A, like a mystery land, but it feels good when we start to enliven that more, and then we can start to listen more to our belly. Like, what does my gut say? Oh, I don't trust that first. Doesn't feel good. Don't go over there. Well, maybe that's some wisdom in there. My yoga teacher says, "Listen to Squeaky." <laughs> Squeaky's that little voice in the mind that goes, maybe I shouldn't do the 108 back bends today. <laughs> That's his story. My, my yoga teacher was a protege of Iyengar. He was like Vietnam vet, special forces, total warrior spirit, amazing human being. Shandor Remite, founder of shadow yoga. So he tells this story about one day his commitment his spiritual commitment was on every i don't know if it was full moon new moon or i don't remember once a month to do this is an ashtanga thing is to do 108 back bends and then i don't know if he'd flip back up to standing or if he'd just come back up and um one day it was his day to do it but it was a really hot summer day on a wood floor in an apartment and squeaky said to him you're not feeling so good today you're feeling kind of run down and tired maybe not a good day to do 108 back bends but he overrode squeaky and did it anyway and i don't know how many in maybe halfway through he was so hot and sweaty, his hands were slippery. His hands coming back into the back bend slipped, boom, boom, both slipped, and he dislocated both of his shoulders. <laughs> so I happened to have signed up for a retreat with him. It was the first retreat he taught after that happened. It happened a few months earlier. When he came, he came teaching the retreat with both arms in a sling. He could not wipe his ass. He couldn't blow his nose. He couldn't feed himself. 
couldn't use his hands. His wife had to take care of him like a baby. And um, that whole retreat, he taught with his, he'd teach, he'd talk us through things and he'd adjust us with his toes. <laughs> he was known for really great hands-on adjustments, but we didn't get that that time. <laughs> But he, he taught that. You got to listen to squeaky. You know, sometimes the voice, the inner voice in there. And that's the gut. It, in my, you know, for me, that's the, the gut. That's the belly center. Is your belly set, center enlivened? You know, when we override the heart and the belly with our head, it's a kind of a form of violence in a way, you know can be abusive, can be harsh, can be unfeeling, it can be dogmatic, it can be um, uh, inflexible. So yeah, Karen, drop into the belly, drop into the heart and meditate from there. And listen to squeaky. <laughs> that I haven't told that story in ages. I never tell that story to anybody. It's not really my story to tell, but for some reason, um, I thought it could be helpful. Maybe it'll save some use, <laughs> you know, unnecessary harm, karmic harm. <laughs> Talking about karma tonight. So maybe the theme tonight will be listen to squeaky <laughs> karma, the law of cause and effect. <laughs> okay. Anyone else before we dive into the topic? I mean, this is all the topic. There's no off topic in a sense. Karma, everything's interrelated. When I saw this, that my night was a karma night, I was like, oh no, I gotta do karma, <laughs> do karma again. Uh, my karma to do karma. Well, the quote from the Buddha that that is uh, on page 31, right at the beginning of the karma chapter, is without doing any harmful act, abundantly perform beneficial acts. Completely tame your mind. This is the Buddha's teaching. There's so much in there. You know, when you first go to a teacher and say, please, you know, I'll make an offering. May I learn from you? Please grant me your blessing. Please give, bestow your teachings. The first thing that a, a teacher of any worth will do is to encourage you to abstain. This is in the Buddhist, I'm giving like Buddhist paradigm, is to abstain from doing harm. You know, it's like when there's pollution flowing in a river, how do you clean up the river? Well, if, before you start cleaning up the river, you have to stop the pollution. Just cut off the pipe. Close it. So that's the first step we should learn. Okay, you know, first order of business, refrain, pull back from, do less harm or no harm. And that's kind of like the first step in kind of rewiring our karma. One, one person was talking, it was kind of a podcast, I was floating around looking at karma and other topics and I liked what she said she said that karma we can think of karma as like the, the groove you know karma our karmas are the grooves that we tread again and again and again and again and again and then that becomes habit so when we refrain from harmful acts we're kind of ungrooving those grooves so that we can then experience we can do less harm but and then experience more positivity more goodness in our life and then this quote says abundantly perform beneficial acts so that's step two right so step one is to refrain from doing harm refrain from polluting the river step two is then start doing good things in the river start cleaning it up doing what needs to be done so with abundance so then we, we start, then we can start enacting more. You know, we can do these in tandem too. It's not like you only have to refrain for a while and then you can start doing good things. You can do them both at the same time. It's kind of like in the order of importance because it's first you got to stop the bleeding, right? 
Yeah. So then perform beneficial acts, so acts of kindness, right? Compassion, giving, generosity, the six paramitas, patience, diligence, you know, saving lives instead of taking lives, giving instead of stealing, you know, all the opposites of the non-virtues. And then the third line is completely tame your mind. So that's shamatha right there, shamatha, calm abiding. The Tibetan for shamatha is shine. Shine. She means peace or peaceful in this context. And then ne means to abide. So calm abiding. And we're calm abiding, we're, we're taming our mind into calmness, right? Because when the mind is agitated, we're, we suffer. And what's interesting is within the taming, we find freedom. So it's not like a constricting prison, like taming the lion in the cage. It's actually like regrooving the mind towards positivity, wholesomeness, so that then we experience less suffering and more, more ease in our life. And by doing shamatha, it's like constraining the wandering mind is actually very satisfying. Have you felt that? That's why you keep coming back, right? That's why you're into dharma and meditation is there's this quality of like when we effort to tame the mind, it's actually very liberating. It's very healing. That always helps me. Because sometimes my, my, my instinct is to rebel, right? But if I know that the, the, the training wheels that their teachers are putting on me to get my mind to train are going to give me more freedom because I've tasted it, I've experienced it, I've learned about it, then I'm going to be like, okay, you know, put the training wheels on for a while. I know it's good for me. But then we can take them off. And then the mind is just fine without taming. But we have to put the work in, you know. Remember, we can't have the post-meditative state without the meditative state. <laughs> we have to develop our meditation practice. And then this is the Buddha's teaching. It's very pithy. And then following that is a wonderful kind of really wonderful passage by Matthew Ricard that I want to read to you. He says, all phenomena arise from the combination of an infinity of causes and conditions in constant flux. Like a rainbow that appears when the sunlight hits a patch of rain and vanishes when one of the factors contributing to its formation disappears. Phenomena occur only through interdependent circumstances and are therefore devoid of independent and permanent existence. It's all explained right there. Emptiness. That's emptiness. It's interdependence. When we, when we understand shunyata from kind of like the empty, from the, the, the absence side, we understand it as emptiness, like empty of intrinsic existence. All qualities, thoughts, feelings, perceptions, cups, computers, light bulbs, speakers, microphones, they are all come together to causes and conditions. They are empty of an intrinsic existence. Like, is this microphone, like, is it, the, is it the phone that is the microphone? Or is it the little mechanical things inside? But which one? Like, you know, we can't really find the thing that's the microphone. So therefore, it's empty of intrinsic or separate existence independent existence when we talk about emptiness from kind of the more full side we talk about tendral or pratitya samutpada which is interdependence that it's all a web like what matthew ricard is saying that because it, there's no solidity it's all this flowing flux of web-like movement and arising and passing and appearing and disappearing like a rainbow that arises when causes and conditions come, sunlight hits it, and then vanishes when those conditions disappear. That all phenomena occur only through interdependent circumstances, tendril, and are therefore devoid of independent and permanent existence. So 
So karma is, refers, is a Sanskrit word. The karma, the root of the word is kr, K-R. And that literally means action. So it's, in the Dharma teachings, it's cause and effect. That every, every cause has an effect. And in this particular aspect, it's the law of causality, cause and effect. It is what shares or determines our share of happiness and suffering. So karma has these aspects of body, speech, and mind, right? So our actions through the body, words through speech, thoughts through mind, all of these are karmas. They're all creating, they're all arising due to karmas. They're all creating more karmas. You know, by being in a human body, I'm creating karma right now as I'm talking to you. You're creating karmas as you're listening and thinking, taking notes. You know, all of these things are karmas. Sometimes people think that karma is is like a negative. It's not. It's, it, in and of itself, karma is not a negative thing. It doesn't have that intrinsic quality to it. There are the three aspects of karma. There can be positive karma, negative karma, and neutral karma. And what, what do you think, this I'm asking you now, what do you think determines whether karma and action is positive, negative, or neutral? You can chat it in. What do you think? Chat it in. Intention. I know Pamela and Mace, you guys don't count. <laughs> okay, good. Nick and Sylvia, attention. Intention. Motivation. Yeah, look at you. You're busted. You're the good student. You're the student who's always raising their hand. The teacher's trying to... Uh, anyone else? Anyone else? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, intention. That the Buddha taught. I'm not making this up. Buddhists taught that what determines whether karma or action or speech or thought is negative, positive, or neutral in terms of like, will it give rise to more positive states or more negative states or neutral states is the motivation behind it. And this has really become, becomes more prominent in the Mahayana era. In the Hinayana, or oh, I shouldn't have said that, in the Theravada or earlier phase of Buddhism, foundational phase of Buddhism, Hinayana is a derogatory term that came later called the lesser vehicle. So I try not to use that because I don't think the early vehicle is lesser. I mean, geez, it was the words of the Buddha for crying out loud. <laughs> Who am I to judge? So in the early vehicle, it was more about rules, more about following the, the, the Vinaya, the monastic code. It really became more and more strict as the centuries went on after the Buddha died to the point where it became really um, I mean, hundreds of vows that monastics have to take. And then you have to purify if you break the vow. It's then Mahayana kind of the middle phase of development of Buddhism that came around the turn of the millennium rebelled against that and said, no, what really determines the outcome of an action is your motivation behind it. So in a sense, it kind of freed people up again a bit more. So even something that seems negative, but if it has a positive motivation behind it, will not bear negative effects, it'll bear positive effects. I mean, there are all sorts of kind of jataka tales and extreme stories about that. Right, exactly. Can killing to save the innocent from being killed then be acceptable? That is in theory what is taught in Buddhism. There's a whole story of an earlier life of the Buddha, by the way, in a jataka tale, he was already pretty clairvoyant and he was on a boat and he's he was like on a, a sailboat a big big shipping boat out at sea and through his clairvoyance he could tell that there was um someone on the ship who was planning on murdering a bunch of people and so in order to avoid in order to stop this person from murdering people and creating and hurting them but also accumulating more negative karma for that them themselves murderer themselves he killed this man so 
there are stories about that. It's an extreme example. Sometimes being honest is might seem harmful, but we're we're we it's actually can be beneficial in the long term because we're not enabling. Like if we have to tell someone some constructive feedback or something like that, it might hurt them. But if our motivation is good, it can bring more benefit and healing in the long run because we're not enabling them with their destructive behavior. So they're kind of more nuanced and more applicable things that normal everyday people like us <laughs> can can understand. Now the main point is motivation. That's what determines. For example, okay, obviously it's not nice to step on bugs. If you see a spider or a bug and you intentionally like step on it and kill it with that, you know, negative intention, that is going to accumulate more negative karma than as opposed to if you're just unknowingly walking on the earth and you step on one by mistake, that's more neutral. So they say that if you kill that same spider unknowingly, that's neutral karma. It's not going to like accrue in your karma, your negative karma bank. Okay. Okay, let's move on. So though that's kind of like karma basics, right? You have karma of body, speech, and mind, and then you have negative, positive, and neutral karma, cause and effect. Those are things that all of us can know, you know, those, those basic karma teachings. And then we have a couple of nice quotes I want to share. As uh, Shanti Deva said, beings long to free themselves from misery, but misery itself they race to catch. They long for joy, but in their ignorance destroy it as they would a hated enemy. So this is also pointing to the sad irony of people are confused about how to create causes of happiness in their life, you know? I mean, we th- we can just see that when we watch children. <laughs> you know, children are great, but they're also learning how to be human beings. And, you know, children might be like, give it to me. You know, I want, I want that. Because they think they want that thing. But then when they get it, you know, it could cause them suffering or they're hurting another person and then they get in trouble. And they're suffering because they just got punished because they got in trouble. You know, it's this kind of, or we can think of uh, addiction, right? So heroin, you know, might feel good. So beings long to free themselves from misery. Okay, so if I'm addicted to heroin, I shoot up, I feel good for a little bit. I'm free of misery for a little bit. But misery itself, they race to catch. And the downfall, it's horrible. So we can look at our whole consumerism, our consumerist culture, and see ourselves in this quote. Buy more, do more, be more. You've all heard this before, right? It's nothing new. You'll be happy if you do this. Oh, buy this face cream, get this liposuction, whatever. They long for joy, but in their ignorance destroy it as they would a hated enemy. And that's the tragedy, is that they just, they often, a lot of people just don't know. They don't know. What he's saying here is that, oh, how the sorrow of seeing how beings unknowingly create causes for more suffering. And that in and of itself is a reason for bodhicitta's. Ningje, you know, Ningje is compassion. And sometimes the Tibetans will say, oh, Ningje, you know, when they see this type of thing. Or somebody get hurt or suffering. Okay, the other quote I really liked was the one from the Dalai Lama, our living, breathing Buddha of our time. He says, the mind is malleable. This is on page 35 of my book. This book we're reading, On the Path to Enlightenment. Dalai Lama says, the mind is malleable. This is great news, by the way that we're not set with what we've got. We can change. It is capable of change. So we need to learn to see how we can transform it. 
we need to identify the ways to achieve that transformation and put them into action. Samsara, the circle of existence, and nirvana, the state beyond it, are not like geographical locations far from one another. They are two states of mind. Samsara is a deviation from knowledge. So important, everyone. That literally samsara is a state of mind that has veered away from knowing itself, from knowledge, from wisdom. That is samsara. Samsara is a distorted vision of reality that makes the mind the slave of negative emotions. While nirvana is a state of inner freedom, free of any conceptual and emotional obstacles. That's enlightenment right there. He's saying conceptual and emotional obstacles. The, the, the Buddhist nerd might go, oh yeah, that's the... Um, the obstacles to, that is, the emotional obstacles are the five poisons. Right, Pamela? <laughs> the five poisons of ignorance, aversion, craving, those are the main three, pride and jealousy. Those are the extra two for fun. <laughs> Just to make some sorry a little more fun, they put in pride and jealousy in there. So those, like, so he's saying nirvana is being free of those. And we can really understand those as just the stem cells that give rise to all the other wonderful ways we can suffer. And then the other is conceptual obstacles, right? And essentially, conceptual obstacles in Buddhist speak refers to not understanding emptiness, reifying permanence solidity, separateness. So when we're free, when we understand emptiness and we're free of those, when we understand shunyata and tendril and we're free of those emotional obscurations, boom, nirvana. Next time you're with the teacher, say, so what is enlightenment? See if they can answer you <laughs> without giving you some new age jargon. Just, just ask them. What is it? How, what is it? Okay. He says, all things, including nirvana, arise from causes and conditions. To find happiness, it is indispensable to have a correct view of the nature of mind and the world. So he's saying this is what Buddhism, why people like Buddhism is because it's logical. Like, oh, if I can align myself with reality, then I'm going to suffer less because I'm not struggling. I'm not fighting reality anymore. I get it. I'm getting it. Impermanence, emptiness, compassion, essential goodness. Okay. So, again, to find happiness, it is indispensable to have a correct view of the nature of mind and the world. So the nature of mind is luminous, right? Like the sun. And it is knowing. Rigpa. It knows itself. It's aware. It's wakeful. And it's vast like the sky. So those are very common ways of describing the nature of mind. And that we taste that when we meditate, then we know it. It goes from here to here and then the belly. Someone who, and then the nature of the world would be shunyata, tendril, all the emptiness, interdependence that we've been talking about. Someone who has a wrong view about the nature cannot, about that nature, cannot transform themselves to attain liberation. What is meant by right view, in quotes, is not faith or believing in a particular dogma, but a clear understanding that is reached through thoroughly examining reality. This kind of examination will refute the belief in the independent existence of things, which is the root of our distorted vision of the world. 
and replace it with the right view. So if we understand emptiness, that's the right view. Shunyata. We understand interdependence. That is right view. Wrong views are believing in solidity, in the sense of, like, like you said, independent existence of things, reifying the self, not understanding impermanence, not appreciating and respecting karma. That's like from the Buddhist, when you hear right view, you understand, okay, that's what they mean by right view and wrong view. Last part, acquiring the right view implies a recognition that the nature of Buddhahood is the essence of our own mind, our fundamental cognitive ability, luminous and pure without confusion. It also involves identifying the factors that keep us from perceiving that nature so that it becomes possible for us to remove them. So in a way, he's like a a surgeon, the Dalai Lama. He's a physician, you know, he's very particular. This, his training, you know, is Gelukpa with debate and logic, you know, it's like, in order to become free of those causes of our suffering, we have to understand what they are. We have to kind of like uproot. And the, the core root is, of suffering is reifying our separate sense of self. If we can pull that main root out, then all the other healing happens. It's like pulling the poison out from the root. And exactly, we all have Buddha nature. We all have that from the Buddhist teaching that we are all... You know, in the early foundational teachings, they didn't emphasize this so much. The Buddha nature came up more in the third turning of the wheel, which they said the Buddha did teach. Well, the Mahayana say the Buddha taught it. <laughs> but didn't emphasize it. And then it became more emphasized later because it was more palatable later. And earlier interpretations of the teachings will, will kind of be more like, oh, we have to fix ourselves. You know, we're, we're not actually already perfect just as we are. But Mahayana and Vajrayana tends to say, yeah, you've already got the Buddha nature, the Tathagata Garbha, the seed of Tathagata, which is the thus gone one. Garva means womb or seed, so that we all have that. But that wasn't so emphasized in the early teachings. It's very emphasized here because the Dalai Lama is coming out of Mahayana. But you might have noticed if you come from Theravada spheres, if you're really studying with a traditional Theravada, they're not really going to talk about Buddha nature very much. It's interesting. Um, so... But we all, you know, the, this teaching that, that we, we, that the Buddha nature, the nature of Buddhahood is the essence of our own mind. It really is just so, ba it's so yes, yes, yes. It's not like nature of mind's over here and Buddhahood's over here or Buddha nature's over here. It's like make an equal sign, you know, nature of mind equals Buddha nature equals shunyata equals prajnaparamita equals rigpa equals dharmakaya. They're all pointing to the same thing. And then, of course, the most beautiful teaching of all is this from Padmasambhava, the great Indian 8th century adept, tantric master who came and brought Buddhism to Tibet. To Tibet. He, he was, he really, he didn't bring, he wasn't the first one to bring Buddhism to Tibet, but he w was the one to really root it in Tibet. His famous quote on karma says, even, even though my view is as vast as the sky, the attention I pay to my actions and their effects is finer than barley flour. This sampa in Tibet, uh, they eat this fine ground barley flour. So when we realize emptiness, the nature of mind, it's very expansive. But that doesn't mean we can just do whatever we want. We have to respect cause and effect. Matthew Ricard says, when your realization of emptiness of all phenomena becomes as vast as the sky, your confidence in the law of causality of actions will grow proportionately. 
and you will become aware of the real significance of your conduct, your behavior. You'll be more sensitive about what you say and do because you understand the ripple effects. In fact, relative truth is inseparable from absolute truth. The profound realization of the empty nature of all things has never led anyone to believe that positive actions do not create happiness and negative actions do not cause suffering. So what he's saying here is that, you know, sometimes people will get so spiritual, they, they, they lose their heart, you know, they feel, oh, I don't need to. They become nihilists in a way. But that's the, the Buddhists are very careful not to let that happen by quotes like this, teachings like this. Like if you really have an authentic understanding of emptiness, you become a kinder person. You become more compassionate, not a bigger you-know-what. And if you're studying with someone or with a spiritual person who's a big you-know-what, you know, get some distance. <laughs> One of the signs of a teacher is compassion, you know, compassion. They have to have bodhicitta. If they don't, then you don't want to practice what they're practicing. Okay, a question coming in. Do we have to believe in reincarnation to believe in karma teachings? No. No, I mean, maybe the Dalai Lama will say different. <laughs> but I, I think that... Um, I don't think he would, because this whole question of reincarnation can be such a hiccup for people that um, it can alienate if, if, if it were meant to be big, the big part of the bundle. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you can just the most important thing is to look in the moment, right? Like when people, or there's one dialogue between teacher and student and I don't remember who it was. I think it's Tibetan Tibetan teacher and Tibetan student asked the student asked the teacher about their past lives, and the the teacher said, "If you want to know your past lives, look in your look in the present moment right now, the present condition. And if you want to know understand your future lives, look in the present condition, because the the results of the earlier karmas are here and now. That's all that matters. And the seeds for future karmas are right here, right now, and that's all that matters." So I don't like to get too wrapped up in whether reincarnation exists or doesn't exist. There's all sorts of, Buddhists have some pretty good logic around it, but, you know, I like what the Dalai Lama says. He says, you know, we don't, it's hard to prove it. Um, so why not, it's just, why not just hedge your bets and act as if there were another life, you know, so that, you know, it's a good motivator to do good. If you think, oh, Next life, I'll reap what I sow. And if there isn't another life, then at least you've lived a good life with integrity. We've got a few more minutes. Any other questions? So that was, I think we made it through a little bit without too many bumps. Karma? Karma? I think I had to teach on karma last time we taught on karma, didn't I? <laughs> oh, good. That's great, Leanne. Yeah. So much better than original sin, yeah. Yeah. Although I, I said that once in a retreat I was teaching in Europe, and, and a very learned scholar of Christianity and Judaism came up and said, you know, this original sin is really misunderstood. He pointed me to some articles that I perused uh, with the intent of going back and doing deeper research, and I didn't ever do that, so I can't speak to it right now, but I'd like to just put that out there, that, um, that the original sin gets a bad rap because it's a bit misunderstood, I, is what I was told. Uh, maybe we can uncover a bit more in our own free time. Oh, it was my karma to teach about karma. It sure was. Well, everybody, if there aren't any other questions, we could just uh, get a little five-minute 
earlier to bed if we want. Don't forget about um, the practice of generosity in terms of the dana for our wonderful organization here that is I can't wait till we can be in person again. This online reality is convenient, but it's also kind of tiring. For me, I, I get so much by being in the same room with a lot of you. Um, of course, I like being with you no matter what, but I just had that feeling tonight of like, oh yeah, another online class. When <laughs> I'm actually going to teach my first retreat after Christmas. I haven't been in a room with people in a retreat uh in two years almost almost two, a year and three quarters do you want to sing a song we could do that we could sing a mantra do you want to do a mantra yeah okay let's see what we should sing Tara is coming to me. We'll do Tara, female Buddha of compassion. Om Tare Tutare Ture Swaha is the Tara ten syllable mantra. I'll put it in the means, oh, Tara, Tara, please come swiftly, oh, Tara. May it be so. Tara said to be swift like the wind. So when we pray to her, she comes. Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu re swaha, om tare tu tare, 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 tu re swaha, Ah, om tare tu tare tu re swa 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 ah, om tare tu tare Tu re swaha 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 om om tare tu tare tu re swaha may the great mother bless you walk with you be with you in your dreams and your waking and your sleeping may she may she protect all beings from suffering and danger and may all beings taste the nectar of their own blissful tathagata garbha buddha nature 
Thank you, everyone. May you be well. Thank you, Mace and Pamela, and everyone else who helps to make these events happen. Good to be with you. Eve will be with you next week. Oh, not next week. No one will be with you next week. <laughs> and then I believe it's Eve after that. All right. Thank you all. Take care. Thanks, Chandra. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody. You can unmute and say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.